Well, on Sunday mornings, we've been looking for a number of weeks now at the distinctives of the Foursquare Church. We are a Foursquare Church. We're part of the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. Honestly, um, you don't hear that brought up a whole lot. I thought it was time to do a series. If you look at our big blue sign out front, you will see, I know the, you know, the script, Family Life Church, you'll see the small words, Foursquare. We don't hide it. We're proud of it, but we don't, it's not the first thing you hear in our church. And it's been a long time since I really took time to deliberately and carefully explain the distinctives of the Foursquare Church. There are four major ministries of Jesus that we stress. Um, the first is Jesus is the Savior. You hear that a whole lot. Jesus is the healer. We spent about five weeks on that recently. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. That's what makes us a Pentecostal church, or you might use the term charismatic church. And the fourth is Jesus is the soon coming king. He's coming back again. He's returning um, one day, and it could be very soon. It could be this afternoon. Um, we're in the middle of talking about Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. The first Sunday I... I um, talked about a biblical background, both Old and New Testament, on what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, where we get it from in the scriptures, just to give you a good biblical uh, background for it. Last week, I mainly emphasized misunderstandings about it, because there's a lot of misunderstandings about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and and people get very um, very concerned or offended or upset because they misunderstand it, And, and many times churches misrepresent it. They give it the wrong emphasis, and I hope you picked up near the end of my message last Sunday that the the sole purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to promote Jesus Christ. It's not to promote gifts of the Holy Spirit, not to promote speaking in tongue, not to promote prophecy or gifts of healings or other gifts that are new in the scripture. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit himself is always to promote Jesus. The gifts are to promote Jesus. If you ever see the the gifts used in a way other than that, um, there needs to be an adjustment. If you visit a church and and it's all about the gifts, there needs to be an adjustment because it should always, always, always be all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope you can say a big amen to that. There's never been a shortage of opinions in the world. You know that. All you have to do is get married. (laughs) And you find out that the two of you have different opinions, right? I remember um, the pastor that married us. He's a Lutheran pastor out in Northern California. and, And we were discussing... Well, I thought we were discussing, not that it's relevant this morning per se, but we were discussing if it's necessary in a church for every person in the church to have exactly the same convictions about theology before you take communion together. That was the substance of the, of the discussion. And Pastor Muley, who's now with the Lord, told me, he said, well, George, he said, if you had to have perfect agreement on doctrine in order to take the Lord's Supper together, I couldn't take the Lord's Supper with my wife. <laughs> I never forgot that. There's lots of opinions in the world. There's lots of opinions in this room right now. If you're married, there's differences of opinion between you and your, your wonderful spouse. When Paul went to Athens, he ended up meeting with the, the group called the Areopagus, or, and The book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 21, says, Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They just got together every free moment when they weren't working, got together and went to the public square just to hear some some new thought, some new idea, some new trend. And, of course, we see the same today. I mean, if you're on social media at all, if you watch Facebook Reels or something, there's just no end to differences of opinion. Read differences of opinion on how to lose weight. What diet is good? What's bad? What, what works? What doesn't work? And you have vastly opposing ideas on the same platform. And if you're smart, you say, well, they can't all be true. What is true? What is behind that person saying you need to eat nothing but red meat? And somebody else saying, well, it's a keto diet. And somebody else, a low carb. I mean, it's all these different opinions. 
And yet people will hold dearly to them and, and fight over them and say, no, this is, this is the, the one that works. This is the work. This work for me. Therefore, it's what everybody needs to be doing. One of the things that was so refreshing about Jesus' ministry is he didn't just enter the fray with some new opinions that could be tossed about and entertain the, the itching ears of people that just want to hear something new. But Scripture says that he taught as one who had authority. Not as the scribes. When he talked, you sat up and listened. When he talked, you knew this, this was a different level. <laughs> this was a different, this was not what you were used to hearing in the synagogue, where there were all these opposing ideas and different factions. But when Jesus taught, when he spoke, he taught as one who had authority. He wasn't just a new and different opinion, there was something that set him apart, something different about him. There was this authority in everything he said. When it comes to theology, like we've said, there's no end of different opinions on different topics. And people make statements all the time about God. You hear people in your, wherever you live and work or go to school all the time that make concrete statements about God and there's no foundation for what they say. It's their assumption or their conclusion, and they espouse it as though it's authoritative, and yet there's no authority behind it. They'll say, well, my God wouldn't do that, or, or I believe you know, all roads lead to, to heaven. It doesn't matter. They're all the same. And, and people say all kinds of things, and yet there's no authority behind them. Their only foundation is their opinion, or their experience, or what they want to believe. What, what makes them feel best? What makes them feel more at peace, or happiest, or assured, or comforted? When I was in my early 20s and, and going through a pretty serious faith struggle, questioning, is Jesus really God? questioning, is the Bible truly the Word of God? Can I trust it? Is it without error? One of the overarching questions in my mind was, maybe I've just believed that because I was raised to believe it. Just because my parents taught me that, therefore I was raised in this Christian realm, Christian framework, I was raised to believe Jesus was God, and and the Bible was true. And I, I questioned if I just believed it because I was raised in it. And a lot of people, the convictions they have are just because that's what they were raised in. And they never really question it. And I, I, I've known the older people get, the more they, they tend to become <laughs> resolute in what their convictions always have been. And they even stop questioning or thinking. They say, well, this is how I am. This is how I was raised. And that's, that's you can't even entertain a discussion with them because they're so resolute in how they've always been. And often it's a certain church background. Delivery not mentioned certain denominations here this morning, but people get very resolute. Go, well, I was raised this way. I was baptized, confirmed, whatever, this way. And they don't even think anymore. They don't even look at what the Bible says anymore. It's just this, this assumption, well, this is just what I am. We want to base our life on truth. We want to base our theology, our convictions on the truth of the Word of God, not on, well, I was just raised this way. My family's always been this way for generations. Not on warm feelings or comfort. Well, I just feel assured if I take this as true, it makes me feel good, makes me not be afraid of dying one day. It just kind of puts my mind at, at ease. We want to be people that are have our our theology, what we believe based on a good basis, a solid foundation on the truth. And of course, the truth is the Word of God. There's nothing new about false teachers or false teachings. There have always, always since the beginning of time been false teachers, people with a different idea, espousing a different viewpoint, a different doctrine. There will always be them. Um, I mean, the Bible even talks about in the end time, there'll be people doing who are false teachers, and they do all kinds of supernatural miracles 
that get people to follow them. But it's all by the power of Satan. It's all demonic. And there are people that will follow somebody because they see a miracle. Well, that must be true because I just saw a miracle. And the Bible says, watch out, because in the times there's going to be a lot of deception. There'll be a lot of seduction by false teachers. And you'll see something miraculous and say, oh, that's got to be true. That's got to be more true than what Pastor George says. Because look at that amazing miracle that just took place. Watch out. There have always been false teachers. There always will be until Jesus returns. False teachers can sound smooth and appealing, but from what authority do they speak? I've always said, this is a cynical statement. Don't take it as, it's just something cynical I say you know, behind the scenes of my family. <laughs> Denise, you'll like this. I've always said that any preacher that has a British accent automatically is thought to have more of the anointing of God on his life. Just because of the sound of that voice. That's got to be God. I can't even imitate it right now because that, that voice is so pleasing and so wonderful. Well, it's just an accent. It's just a dialect they picked up. It doesn't mean they're any more true or right or anoint anybody else, but it's, it appeals to our flesh to hear a really nice voice and a pleasing um, British accent or an Irish brogue or something. Remember Patrick Hovind used to come to our church? I mean, it's incredible. I mean, you're just, you're just drawn to listen to him because of that Irish brogue. It doesn't mean he's anointed. It's just how he talks. <clears throat> Paul says to Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and good conscience and sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. And also in Timothy, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the truth. So he's saying be, be careful of what you buy into. Be careful of what you're led away into because you can swerve from the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need something more sound when it comes to drawing conclusions about God. And this is certainly true, especially when it comes to talking about the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about spiritual gifts. First, we gave some background on what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, what the Bible says about it. Um, last week, as I already said this morning, I mentioned some of the misunderstandings and its sole purpose is to promote Jesus Christ. Today, we want to talk a little bit about the gift that gets the most attention of all, and that's speaking in tongues. Now, there's a whole host of gifts like word of knowledge and word of wisdom and gifts of healing and all kinds of things, but they never get as much attention as the whole speaking in tongues thing. And that's the one that people raise. And Well, do you speak in tongues? Your church speak in tongues? And, and it gets a lot of attention, I guess, because it's so noticeable and, and so unusual. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Again, we're going to be looking at the Word of God. Speaking in tongues is the most prominent gift of the Holy Spirit. It gets the most attention, but it's not the most important. It's the most prominent, it gets the most attention, but it's not the most important. It gets a lot of attention. Practically everybody has an opinion on it. Either good, bad, or somewhere in between. It's hard to find somebody that doesn't have some opinion that they're ready to come out with if the subject even comes up. I remember growing up at a church in Baltimore, um, the pastor's wife she had one thing to say about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. It's of the devil. That was just her assumption. That was it. Uh, it wasn't the official view of the church or the denomination. I mean, she was never in the pulpit. She was the pastor's wife. But that was her assumption. And, of course, that was said at a time when there was what's known as the charismatic renewal in the country. And so lots of people were talking about um, Pentecostal gifts and charismatic gifts and the charismatic renewal and gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was a really common topic. It's not so much anymore. You don't want to cause many people to talk about it. But back in, say, the, the late 60s, early 70s, 
I would say. That's when it was really big. A lot of amazing things happened in mainline churches, namely demonstration of the gifts. A lot of churches were split by the gifts of the Spirit in operation. There was a lot of, of, well, there was both a lot of unity that came and also a lot of division at the same time. I'm glad you're shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about, Georgia, by that. Um, <clears throat> so today, like I said, I'm not sure people really talk as much about speaking in tongues as they seem to back in that era, but it still comes up and people have opinions about it. For those of you who love words, sometimes speaking in tongues is referred to as glossolalia, 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 however you want to say it. And it's a combination of two Greek words, glossa, which means language, and lalia, which means speech. So speaking languages, glossa lalila, is speaking in tongues. And believe it or not, when I was in high school, a public high school in Baltimore, when I was a junior, I took a class one semester, and it was called um, Symposium. That was the name of the class, Symposium. And it consisted of a semester of writing papers and giving oral speeches to the whole class based on the papers we'd written. And some of, one of the speeches I did was on glossolalia, Lila, glossolalia, because it was something everybody was talking about. And I thought, well, I'm going to talk about that. And I drew a lot of my material for that speech back when I was a junior in high school from a book called, some of you will have heard of this, They Speak With Other Tongues. Remember that book, Dan and Georgia? They Speak With Other Tongues? by John Sherrill. It's still available on Amazon. I looked it up this week. You still get it. In Scripture, speaking in tongues is the most immediate evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, hear my words carefully. I didn't say it has to be the first evidence. I said it's the most immediate evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Most commonly, it's the first gift that comes, but it doesn't have to be. And some examples of that from the day of Pentecost firstly. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So in that case... Speaking in tongues was that initial evidence that the baptism of the Holy Spirit had come upon them. Same thing in Cornelius' house. We read this story a few weeks ago. While Peter was still saying these things, he was, he was speaking to a bunch of people he had never met before. They had been told by God to send to another town and bring Peter back. They didn't know what they were bringing him back for. They just knew that they had been instructed by God to go to this other town, bring Peter back, Peter didn't know why he was coming, but he had even received a vision from God where he said, some people are going to knock on your door soon. It's okay. It's from me. Go with them and just, just you know, get your traveling bag and, and go with them. And so Peter is preaching to all of Cornelius' family. He's gathered all his family together just the way the Filipinos gather all their family together. So they would all hear whatever it was that Peter was going to tell them, and they didn't even know what it was going to be. For all I knew, it was a, an Amway promotion or an insurance promotion. They didn't know what they're about to hear. Well, Peter does what any good believer does. Mind you, I didn't say a good pastor or apostle or church elder, but any good believer in that situation would say, I'm going to share with you about Jesus. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I'm going to tell you the story of Jesus. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. They were living with the presupposition, well, it's just for us good Jews that have put our faith in the, in the crucified and resurrected Jesus. And here they are seeing Peter share the gospel with Gentiles, who weren't circumcised, obviously non-Jewish, they were Gentiles, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And how did they know the Holy Spirit came upon them? For they were hearing, hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. 
And then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? We emphasized a few weeks ago that the Holy Spirit came even before water baptism. You can't tell the Holy Spirit what he's not going to do or what he shouldn't do. Don't even try. Don't even try because you'll be proven to be wrong every time. Um, and the initial evidence in that case in Cornelius' house for the baptism of the Holy Spirit was something obvious, something amazing, namely speaking in tongues, the glossolalia. In Ephesus, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. So again, you see the tongues are, are typically most often like the first demonstrative evidence. Samaria, then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Now, tongues are not specifically mentioned in that situation, but it's perfectly clear that something obvious took place or else Simon wouldn't say, look, I got to be able to do the same thing. I got some money. I'll give you some money if you teach me that trick. If you teach me how you just did that, where you laid hands on people, said some words, and suddenly they're speaking, they're suddenly Something has happened. They didn't say speaking in tongues, but that's most likely what happened, what it made Simon. So he whose heart was not right thought he could buy the gift of God with cash. The pattern that we see in Scripture, the pattern we most often see in real life experience, is that the gift of speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit's baptism. Does it have to be the initial evidence? No. No, no, a thousand times no. But it often is. I think it usually is. But in the scripture we looked at last week, it says the Holy Spirit gives out his gifts as he will. So he can give a different gift. He doesn't have to give that one. But typically it seems to be what most often happens. Of what use is the gift of tongues? I mean, why even have tongues? Why does the church even need them? Why even bother ourselves talking about them? Well, again, I'll answer my questions from scripture. With tongues, we can speak supernaturally to God. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him, for he utters mysteries in the Spirit. I think every believer has to come to times, maybe even frequent times, when we feel helpless to even know what to pray for. We feel overwhelmed. We're not even sure what what to ask the Lord for in certain situations. That's a golden time to use the gift of speaking in time, tongues. Because you, where, where your wisdom stops, where your ability to say, well, I think I'll pray this and this and this for that person. And you say, I don't, I don't even know what to pray. I just don't even know what to ask for. That's a golden time to use the gift of speaking in, in, in tongues. Tongues provides that supernatural release the ability to express our innermost feelings to God, maybe even deeper than our own consciousness, unhindered by the limitations of our human mind. Unhindered by our, the limitations of our human mind. All of our human minds have limitations. They have great limitations. And tongues is, is deeper than that. So when we use that gift of tongues, we're not hindered by those complicated thinking processes that keep some of us awake at night even. Tongues are a way that believers may glorify God. This is what the believers in Caesarea did. In Acts chapter 10, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. They were worshiping. The gift of tongues goes right along with worshiping God. Um, if the Lord has given you that gift, use it during a time of worship whether it's at home alone or in your car when you're worshiping or in a Sunday morning service when kind of under your breath softly you're using the gift of tongues. Use it as part of your worship of God. Praying in tongues, according to the Bible, will edify ourselves. Paul says that in Corinthians. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up. Again, I don't get this stuff from my own thought processes, my own mind. I Try to draw from Scripture with everything that we teach and preach in this church. The one who speaks in a tongue 
fills himself up. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind also. Did Paul consider the gift of tongues important? Well, most of you would respect the Apostle Paul, and yes, he did. He said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. He would never say that if he did not think it was an important gift, if he thought it was useless, if he thought it was superfluous. He wouldn't say it if he didn't think there was some edifying use in doing it. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. Tongues are a way that our spirits, distinct from our understanding, might pray. When we're praying in our native tongue, we put words together and we understand what we're praying, we understand what we're asking. But when we use the gift of tongues in a personal prayer, it's our spirit that is praying and we don't even know what we're saying. We just know that we're using that tongue the Lord has given us. Book of Romans, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. One time that that takes place, one time when the Holy Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God is when believers use that gift of tongues in their intercession life, in their prayer life. Tongues provide a way of praying when we just don't know what to pray. Paul says, what am I to do? I'll pray with my spirit, but I'll pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I'll also sing with my mind also. Um, great example of this from my wife's life. Um, my wife obviously had parents. <laughs> she had a mother and father. <laughs> Aren't you glad to hear that? <laughs> she wasn't immaculately born or something. <laughs> um, so I had in-laws. I'm trying to work into my story. That's why I'm hesitating. I had in-laws. And Beth's father, when she was a young girl, like 16 or so, um, he had a massive heart attack. You know, I think he had to stop work at that time and go on disability, social security, because he couldn't work. And that was a turning point in his life. It was a turning point because he had backslidden. He had been a strong believer. He had been a pastor. He met his wife in an Assembly of God Bible College. And was it Springfield, Beth? Springfield. And things had happened. Things had happened to him on the mission field. He came back bitter, mad, angry. He left the ministry. He got secular jobs. Um, some of Beth's earliest memories, which always, always kind of affected my heart whenever she talks about this, is going to church, sitting next to her mother, and having her mother cry all during the service because her husband wasn't with her any longer. They had met in Bible school. <laughs> they had gone to the mission field together. They had pastored a little church in Michigan together. And here she sat in church Sunday after Sunday with her young daughter, other children much older than Beth, and there's no husband next to her. And she just cried through worship, cried to the service, and Beth saw her mom crying, and she told me about it. And it still just really affects me when I think of what my mother-in-law went through. Well, um, thankfully, when he had his massive heart attack, um, that, was, that was what got his attention. And he came back to the Lord and decided that from then till the moment the Lord took him home, he was going to serve Jesus with every ounce of energy he had. And so when I came upon the scene and met Beth in the late 70s and met her parents, I met the father-in-law that had come back to the Lord that was using his every ounce of energy to serve the Lord. He was unstoppable. Um, when he retired, he, he'd put on his suit every morning and grab his Bible and head off to hospitals or nursing homes. He became the pastor of the seniors, an unpaid position in their church. He had Belt Bible studies for seniors. He picked them up in their car, him and his wife, and take them to Bible studies and take them home afterwards. I mean, the father-in-law I knew was every ounce of energy was used to serve the Lord. Um, but he knew that one day the big one was going to come again. 
He had had enough heart attacks. He had, had gotten the paddles a couple times, you know, the, the electrical shocks and all. And he told his wife, I don't want to do that again. It was too painful, too awful. Um, next time I have a heart attack, let me go. Let me go home to Jesus. And so sure enough, in December 1994, um, I almost remember the exact date. I know it was December 94. Um, sitting in his armchair at his house, um, it was lunchtime. His wife was making soup on the stove for both of them. He was actually sitting in his chair with his Bible, preparing a funeral message for one of the seniors that had died at church. And that's the moment when he was stricken, when the Lord said, it's time. You're preparing a sermon you'll never get to preach. And there's his wife watching him. She knows what's happening. She knows he said, I don't want the paddles again. Just let me go home. And so she sat there, didn't call 911, but what she did do, and this brings us back full circle, she just sat there and prayed in tongues. She just sat there and prayed in tongues with her husband while his spirit went to heaven. And I think she waited like 30 minutes or so. And then she picked up the phone and, you know, called her Beth's brother. And I don't know who all she called. Probably the, probably the paramedics had to come. They had a you know, certain procedure and things like that. But that's what she did. What, a, what an excellent example in my mind of how that gift can be used. What else are you going to pray at that moment? What else are you going to do at that moment? And she did what was very natural to her. And that's just talk to the Lord in that heavenly language that he had given her. When tongues are combined with the gift of um, interpretation of tongues, that's a separate gift of the Holy Spirit, the church will be edified. Now, I'll explain a little bit more in a minute. So with yourselves, since you're eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Can I just say this morning that when you come to church on Sunday morning, please have it in your heart. What can I do to build up the church today? What would the Lord have me do at Family Life Church today? Please, please, please don't just come out of some obligation. Well, it's Sunday morning. I guess I should go to church. Oh, pastor doesn't preach too long. It's not the first Sunday. It's not a communion Sunday. That won't add 10 minutes to the service. Please don't come just, just for some kind of obligation. And I hope part of your coming is how will the Lord use me today to edify the church? A word of encouragement, maybe just the way you hug somebody. Or maybe somebody is thinking, I think Ray needs me to pray with her. Ray, can I pray with you this morning? But come to church with, Lord, how can I bring encouragement? You know how tough life gets. You know how you feel much of the time. Everybody else is just like you. Come with an idea of how can the Lord use me to edify his church. And one such way that we're referenced right now is when there's a tongue, a speaking in tongue that's given in a service accompanied with an interpretation. First Corinthians 14, so with yourself, since you are eager for manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. What then, brothers, when you come Together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all these things be done for building up, it says, for edifying. God wants every time that we come together as a church to be a building up time. I might mean, hate it if you leave here and you say, well, that was a waste of my time. <laughs> that wasn't God's intention. He wants you to leave saying, say, I needed that today. I'm glad I was there. That's what's supposed to happen when the church comes together. Now, there's a difference, and I want to explain this at this point, between the public gift of tongues and the private gift of tongues. The private gift of tongues is when you, the Lord has given you the ability to speak in tongues, and you use it in your private worship. You use it in um, your private devotion time, maybe just on a Sunday morning or worship time, just kind of, kind of under your breath. You're speaking in tongues. You're not saying it loudly. People you know, barely hear. They're next, next to you, maybe they hear it, but no one else is hearing it. You're not saying it for anybody else. It's just that private gift of tongues. But there's also a public gift of tongues. And that's when 
Just like um, recently we've had a few Sundays when, when somebody came out with a word from the Lord in English that we all understood, we're all edified by, when there's a very obvious message given in tongues. That kind is, according to Scripture, always supposed to come with an interpretation. Otherwise, it avails nothing. It's not, it doesn't edify anybody. It doesn't do anything for anybody, right? Nothing. We don't come together to waste each other's time. The waste of the Holy Spirit's time. So if there is that public gift of tongues used, somebody in the service stops and there's this message in tongues, there is always supposed to be an interpretation. Or else it doesn't edify. Usually the interpretation is from a different person. But I've seen it done where no one else spoke and the person that gave the tongue pauses and then they interpret it. But it really is supposed to be interpreted. We don't want to have it of people just coming out with loud gifts of tongues and no interpretation. It might happen sometimes just because it happens. I've experienced that too. But it's really not how it's supposed to be. It's not the ideal. We wouldn't promote that or, or encourage that. But there is this difference between the public gift of tongues and the private gift of tongues. Um, <clears throat> how important is the gift of tongues? Again, let's look to the scriptures, not our opinions. Paul makes it clear in the text that it is a secondary gift. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. So it's not a permanent gift. It's not going to be in heaven. Nobody will be speaking in tongues in heaven one day. Verse 13 14, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him. But he utters mysteries in the Spirit. So he means when somebody speaks out in a tongue and a serve, no interpretation, it, it doesn't do anything for the rest of us. On the other hand, the one who prophesies, meaning one who speaks a word in English, in our case, speaks to people for their upbuilding and their encouragement and their consolation. So in the scheme of things, tongues are not as important as love. They're not as important as prophecy. But it's not to say that, that there's no place for them. Paul also says, we mentioned this before, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So he wasn't saying, let's discount it, we don't need it, let's throw it out with the garbage. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and, and this is a really key passage for this morning, I don't know if this will be on the screen, do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. So if you have a problem with the whole idea of speaking in tongues, if you don't even like this message today because you think, what is he talking about? Just remember the Bible does say, don't forbid it. Don't forbid it. Maybe there's something you need to grow in, something you need to learn about, something you need to open up your heart to. Don't be one of those that forbids it, like the pastor's wife I grew up with. It's all of the devil. Well, I mean, she was speaking out of ignorance, quite honestly. She's a precious woman, but it was so outside her realm of anything, it just seemed like it has to be wrong. And, and I, I mentioned this early on in talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all things should be done decently and in order. Everything in God's church should be done decently and in order. Everything in a Pentecostal service should be decently done and in order. I've seen things done wrong. In particular, I went to a service once in, in Canada. Um, it was in Toronto at a time, a season, when there was just a lot of talk all over the country about what the Holy Spirit was doing in Toronto, Canada. And so a bunch of us pastors, we wanted to see what was going on in Toronto. So I went up there with, I think Pastor Harry was there, and Pastor Glenn, and Pastor Cozy, and a bunch of us went up to, to Canada to the um, airport vineyard church, that's where it was, to see what was going on and observe. And we, I mean, after all, if there's something we need to know about, we certainly want to bring it back. And if it's something we don't want to know about, we don't want to bring it back, but let's just be open and see what's going on. And um, this is not a critique on everything that I witnessed there, but one thing I did see that I really, really strongly disliked was in the middle of a sermon that the pastor was giving, someone in the audience decided it was a time to break out in holy laughter. Uh, maybe you never heard of holy laughter. Somebody in the country just starts laughing, laughing like you just told them the best joke they ever heard, and everybody around them started laughing. 
And a lot of people, this is God. I'm thinking, this is not God. <laughs> when a man is up on the platform preaching from the word of God, don't distract that. Yes. Don't distract from the preaching of the word of God with what you think is some gift of the Holy Spirit, which I think was total flesh. Attracted a lot of attention. You know, people left the service. They didn't talk about the preaching of the word. Did you see what happened in the service? Did you see the laughter? And, and they'll go home talking about the holy laughter. <laughs> you shouldn't go home today talking about speaking in tongues and about holy laughter. Talk about the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and how great a Savior we have. And how everybody needs to know him. Okay. <clears throat> A Sunday school teacher asked her class one day, what do you do when somebody gives you a birthday present? Little girl in the class answered, you say, thank you, unless it's clothes. <laughs> and then you put a sad look on your face. We've all been around selfish children at Christmas who rip open their gifts, even nice gifts, toys, without any gratefulness. They just open one, set aside, open the next, until there's no more to, to open up. Some people do that with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're just like gifts on Christmas Day. They don't mean much of anything. They're just kind of, you know, wrap it up with a colorful paper and a nice bow. But God gave the gifts of the Holy Spirit to promote Jesus in our lives, in his church, and throughout the world. And God desires, and this is scripture, that we desire spiritual gifts in order that Jesus be elevated. We don't want to be people that just, well, I want nothing to do with that. I'm not touching that. I don't think we need that. Because the Bible talks about them and says, desire them. And don't forbid speaking in tongues. Pursue love, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. We don't want to be found arrogantly sitting in judgment on gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't have the attitude, well, thanks, but, but no thanks. I'll leave that for somebody else. I want nothing to do with that. There are many who recognize possible abuses and conclude that since the gifts can get out of hand and because they can be unbalanced, that it'd be better to just leave them well enough alone. There's a lot of people in that camp. Maybe it's like the pastor's wife I had growing up. Just, well, you know, I've heard some stories. We, we, it's better just to leave that well enough alone, have nothing to do with it. That would be like getting rid of your children because they're bad sometimes. Or not eating out because you got food poisoning once. Yeah, there will be some excesses. There will be some things that really don't unfold the way they're supposed to in the exercise of the Holy Spirit. But don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. That's what we're saying here. Even as early as the Corinthian church, there were problems surrounding the use of the gifts. But Paul's answer was to bring teaching to that situation, bring correction and bring teaching, not we're not going to allow that in the, in the church anymore. When we place ourselves up as critical judges of the Holy Spirit, we actually end up quenching the work of the Holy Spirit. Like Saul, before he became Paul, was obstructing Jesus. So we too, if we're not conscientious about the Word of God, we can actually be unintentionally be fighting against the work of God instead of going along with what the Lord is trying to do. Our job is to seek Jesus and to seek to know him in his fullness. And one way to do that, one way to do it, is through the gift of tongues. It's a gift that God created. It's announced in the Old Testament, book of Isaiah, for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue the Lord will speak to his people. It was poured out on the day of Pentecost. It was poured out in Ephesus and Caesarea and other places in the book of Acts. And it's been poured out millions of times since then on people throughout the world, including my precious mother-in-law, who's now with the Lord, a woman that I deeply respected. And it's a gift that we're told in the scriptures to earnestly desire and not to forbid. Amen.